Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God. Amen. Um, some of you know that I just returned from a two-week trip with some of our church members visiting the places where the Apostle Paul journeyed. When we left, there was Halloween candy still on the shelves for 50% off, and when we came home, it's like Christmas had just exploded all over the place. We all got off the plane and went, whoa, whoa we haven't been gone that long. What happened? How many of you uh, feel like Thanksgiving has just become the starting gate for the run to Christmas? <laughs> and this year it seems especially rushed. Well, that usually starts because we have an extra Sunday this year. It's kind of like day daylight savings time when you get that extra hour of sleep. Well, this year, every couple of years, we get the extra Sunday in there between Thanksgiving and Advent. Usually, Advent starts on the Sunday right after Thanksgiving, but not this year, which is why you see some of our decorations up. You see the chrismon tree, but they're not lit yet, and not everything's up. It's just that our volunteers are available on the weekend after Thanksgiving. So, about every six, seven years, it's not always on rhythm, but it happens this way. This is, liturgically speaking, well, it doesn't have a name for this Sunday. We'll just call it Bonus Sunday. It's, we just, we get a break. We get a bonus Sunday. It's not a liturgical Sunday or a liturgical title, but we get that extra week where we can either choose to be, use it to be anxious about all the things that we have to do to get ready for Christmas, or we can use this bonus Sunday to allow ourselves to take a deep breath as we prepare for Advent in hopes that we don't somehow lose our focus and as so often happens when the runner's gun is fired right after that Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, we don't lose our good intentions by being trampled on by the Christmas rush. I know, I sound like a bah humbug. I don't mean to be a Grinch, but can somebody just push the pause button before we get into this Christmas rush? Let us catch our breath. Well, there's a good word for this this feeling of hitting the stop button or pause button, taking a deep breath and focusing on the moment. It's in the Bible 74 times, almost exclusively in the Psalms. Selah, S-E-L-A-H, Selah. Supposedly, it really doesn't translate very well into English, but it's kind of like saying, hit the pause button. Stop for just a moment and notice what was just said or what just happened or what's going on right now in front of you. Say la. It's a good word for this Sunday. In the psalm that Mike just read for us a minute ago, it, I think it picks up on that feeling. No one really knows who wrote it, and we rarely, if ever, read that psalm in worship, Psalm 131. How many of you are familiar with it? maybe just a few of us. It's a beautiful short psalm written from what appears to be a woman's perspective, which makes it kind of rare. She is speaking humbly and simply of her sense of peace and security, resting in the warm, healing, comforting presence of God, just as the little child who was at that moment resting happily and satisfied in her own arms. It is an image of Selah, a pause in life to take a moment and focus on what is happening right there at that moment. So imagine with me, if you will, this young mother sitting in the shade of, oh, I don't know, an olive tree and somewhere in Israel holding her five-year-old son in her lap and looking at his relaxed, sleeping face smiling to herself and thinking that perhaps what she is feeling for this child right at this moment is exactly the way God feels about her. Now just push the pause button on that image. Take a deep breath and let the beauty of that image and what it says to us about God sink in. 
not rush by and miss it. It is a moment for Selah. Well, speaking of rushing by and missing things, I'm reminded of one summer a couple of years ago, our family was returning from vacation, and we did what we often do at that point. We take the camera, and we hook it up to the computer, and we download all the pictures from our trip, and then we go back over them and, and enjoy sometimes more than the actual trip, just looking at the pictures. Well, this one trip was in Colorado, and my husband, Tom, had taken a very, very close-up shot of a little mountain flower. You know those little tiny ones you see up close to the tundra, the, the timber line? Close-up picture, little flower surrounded by green grass and a white silvery stream in the background and a big speckled gray rock there. It was just a beautiful image. So Tom decided that he liked it so much he would keep it as his screensaver, sort of remind him of this lovely afternoon spent with the family. Well, months went by, actually years went by, and Tom was in his office working late. He took a break, and when he came back, of course, the screensaver had come up. So he let his break time linger a little longer than usual, and he just happened to notice that picture. But he just really hadn't taken time to look at it for a while, so he just thought he'd look at it, savor that happy time in our family's life. And then it just jumped out at him, a black spider. Not, not literally, it was on the screen, not, not in the room, it was on the picture. Sitting right there on the rock beside the flower was this huge black spider. None of us had noticed it before, but he, he or, or she, I don't know how you tell with a spider, but it was sitting on the rock right next to the flower. It had one of his little arms or whatever you call those, kind of raised like maybe he was getting ready to wave at the camera. And once you see it, you know how this happens. Once you see it, you can't not see it anymore. In fact, now when you look at the screensaver, you see a spider. That's all you see. We'd never seen it before. No one had paused long enough to notice. It made us wonder what we miss, what other things we miss on our way to something else. Kind of like what John Lennon wrote when he said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Well, maybe we all need to just push the pause button every once in a while. Take a deep breath. Practice Selah. It's no telling what wonders or moments of awe or messages of grace we might discover right under our noses if we were to do that. A few years ago, one of our members, who's become a good friend of mine, shared a simple story but a life-changing event in his life. It was a moment of Selah for him. He was living in Chicago, working downtown for a big corporation. It was a great opportunity for him just out of college. He wanted to make a name for himself. So he got to work early, was diligent, conscientious about his job, very productive, reliable. And one morning, very early in the summer, the weather in Chicago was just perfect. And he decided he was going to walk to work. He, he lived downtown. It was possible. And he said on his way, he passed an alleyway, and something flashed, this brilliant yellow. And so he stopped, and he went back. And there, he said, he saw one whole wall of that alleyway covered in these thick vines full of these brilliant yellow flowers. So he smiled to himself and he then went on back to his walk, quickening his pace because he was already starting to worry about the projects that were awaiting him when he got to work. But then he said about a half a block down, it hit him. It just hit him. Life was not meant to be lived in such a way that you were too busy to notice something amazing right there on your path. So right then and there, he decided he, to go back. He turned around and went back. And he walked into that alleyway and just took a deep breath and let that fragrance and all that beauty just surround him. And he enjoyed it fully after a long, cold, snowy, slushy Chicago winter. 
And then he said about that time, an, an older gentleman who was sitting on his balcony reading the paper waved at him. He was there in that opening and he said, flowers are beautiful, aren't they? You wouldn't believe how many people just walk right by and never notice them. I get to see them every morning. By the way, this man was late for work. His boss did notice and wasn't pleased. And at the end of the day, when he passed his boss's door on the way home, he went right past it and he did another double take. He stopped, he turned around, he went back, he knocked on the door and he respectfully said, I know I was late coming to work this morning. I want you to know I take my responsibility seriously. I give this job my full attention and my best efforts every day. I am committed to my work. This morning, I passed a beautiful wall of brilliant yellow flowers in an alley as I was walking to work. And I decided on that moment that there was something wrong with my life if, if I couldn't hit the pause button and notice it. I just wanted you to know that I will continue to give this company my very best. But from this day on, if I ever pass a particularly beautiful sight, or a child laughing, or a homeless man who needs a friendly greeting, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause. You can fire me if you need to. I just wanted you to know. Well, he wasn't fired. In fact, he became fairly successful in his career, but I can tell you that that moment made a difference in his life. He held on and practiced that young adult lesson that he had learned, and he became very, very good at Selah. He was a very good practitioner of Selah. I, even to this day, which is probably 40, 50 years later, I've seen him compliment someone on something that was so small, nobody else had really noticed it. He did. He has, on more than one occasion, asked me if I was doing okay when I was convinced I was covering some anxiety or stressful feelings pretty well. But he saw through it. He often has a story about circling around the block so he could help someone because he noticed them too late to stop the first time, but he went back around. Or he'll have a comment about the size of the moon last night or the stars that were out, things that we just walk right past and don't notice. He practiced Selah, and he'd gotten pretty good at it, and it made a difference. So on this uh, bonus Sunday, before we begin Advent, maybe we ought to follow his lead and take advantage of this opportunity for Selah. In the upcoming four Sundays of Advent, we're going to prepare our hearts and our minds for the message of Christmas. But how about right now we just take a deep breath before we begin some of the more challenging work that lies ahead of us. Just breathe. Because you know what happens when you breathe? Life. Life happens. I ha can't count them, but you wouldn't believe how many references there are in the Bible to breathing. Breathing. Breath in the Bible. Um, the reason it's hard to count, because you can go to places and say how many times is such and such a word listed there. The reason it's hard to count is because when you translate the Old Testament Hebrew into English or the New Testament Greek into English, we have different words. And so you have to count the number of times you have words such as wind or breath or spirit. They can be somewhat interchangeable. And so, for example, in Genesis, when it says a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, that word for wind, ruah, means breath. God breathes on the chaos, and there is order, and there is light, and life, and it is good. God breathes life. Same in the story of Pentecost in the New Testament, when we read that there came the sound like the rush of a mighty wind, and the church, the body of Christ, came to life. Well, the Greek word for wind there is pneuma. Think pneumonia in our language. It means breath. So a breath of God brought life to the church. It's the same exact word used in the story of Jesus calming the violent storm on the Sea of Galilee. You remember that story. We often tell it incorrectly, saying that Jesus calmed the sea. 
And I don't mean to nitpick, well actually I do, because if we're gonna talk about breath and we're gonna talk about translations, we better get it right. It doesn't say Jesus calmed the sea. It says Jesus calmed the wind, Numa. That says a lot more to me. It says that the gospel writer there wasn't trying to just say that Jesus did this dazzling, miraculous event out there. He's also saying that Jesus had command of that ruah, that pneuma, that breath of God, that life-giving breath of God that had been part of God's creation from the very beginning. Jesus was connected to that breath of life. So think about it. Just in the mostly unconscious act of breathing, we are, on the most basic level, acknowledging the life-giving presence of God with us. God who is as near to us as our next breath. I mean, look at the role of breathing in our lives, not just the role of keeping us alive, but the way we breathe in our lives and at different moments in our lives. We breathe deeply and intentionally if we want to be calm, don't we? Or the way we suck in our breath when we receive news that's unexpected. Or how about the way we take a deep and determined breath to steel ourselves to face something we don't want to have to face? Or what about when a friend is panicked or anxious, we say, breathe, just, just breathe, breathe breathe to keep them going and what about those takes our breath away moments those feelings when we experience something of great beauty or amazing grace or deep love it really isn't so much about having our breath taken away but it causes us to take a breath hold on to it for just a moment and then let it out with a deep sigh of awe Maybe all of those moments are our ways of bringing God closer to us, our way of recognizing that God is as near to us as our next breath. And in the act of breathing, God brings comfort. God brings strength, peace, and even joy. Every breath we take, every breath we take is an opportunity to connect us with God. Now, let's look at the ways that we talk about breathing in our lives, or the role of breathing in life, mostly without thinking about it. Just last week, I heard a woman talking about her workplace. Apparently, it was a place of bickering and complaining and a lot of negative attitudes. I'm glad none of us work in places like that, do we? She said it sucked the life out of her. She felt like she was suffocating. Think about that. Negative, bitter, bickering, sucking the life out of us, taking our breath away in a very different way. Or think about the way people breathe when they're angry or they're upset. It's a tight, strained, growling kind of breathing. It can't be good for you. Or what about the way we breathe when we're terrified? We don't, we hold our breath. Or we take quick and shallow breaths when we're nervous or we're self-conscious or we feel threatened in some way. Think about the role of breathing. If we look at breathing, just bear with me a minute here. If we look at breathing as a metaphor for our relationship with God, it gets really pretty interesting. If we relate to God based on a theology of threat or fear, which is so common, what do our, what, how do we breathe? Shallow, strained, defensive. And taken to its extreme, we hold our breath and we take what is life-giving oxygen and it turns into something poisonous, doesn't it? It's what happens when our theology is based in fear or threat or control. And then think about when we, our metaphor for God and our breathing, when our relationship is based in a theology of trust or love or grace. Our breathing becomes calm and deep. It is life-giving, life-affirming, life-nourishing. 
last Friday. It is our tradition now, three years makes it a tradition, right? It is our tradition that we go out uh, shopping for our Christmas tree on the day after Thanksgiving. And we go to a little farm just south of town near Burleson. It's our tradition to do that in the morning and then we go out to the same restaurant for lunch to celebrate like we need more food after Thanksgiving. Anyway, we were standing outside the restaurant last Friday saying our goodbyes when this couple just burst out the door and they were holding their breath until they got outside. Then they just burst out laughing and they looked at each other and they started looking around as if they had just left the scene of some crime and ran to their car and took off. It was kind of strange. Well, a few minutes later, a waitress came running out of the restaurant, out of breath, asking us if we'd seen that same couple. We told her they'd just left and they seemed pretty excited about something, and she said they had just left her a $100 tip. She thought it was a mistake, maybe. She wanted to make sure that it wasn't a mistake and tried to stop them, and we told her, well, now that I think about it, I, I think they did that on purpose. They were pretty happy about what they had just pulled. Let me tell you, it took her breath away. And I think that was their intention. I think we have done God a great disservice when we fail to notice all the little means of joy and beauty and goodness that are right in our path. All the little moments that ask us to pause, say la, pay attention. And not just pause, but also participate. Every moment of Selah, every time we stop to take a deep breath and remember, that is a moment of invitation to participate in sharing God's goodness, offering somebody else the opportunity to have their breath taken away. So how about today, on Bonus Sunday, we make a pledge to start paying more attention during Advent. How about when you're standing in that long line at Walmart on a Friday night, the Friday before Christmas, I, I don't know why anybody in their right mind would do that, but just for the sake of example, you're standing in line at Walmart on the Friday night before Christmas, your feet are hurting, the kid behind you is pushing the cart into your backside, and the Christmas music playing over the sound system is just about to push you over the edge. Take a deep breath. Notice the man behind the counter ringing up all those lines of people, many of them as grumpy as you feel, and think about something kind to say to him, because you know he's tired. Or the mother of that pesky child behind you. Maybe it's all she can do to keep up with her life, and she's just too exhausted to even notice his rude behavior anymore. Or maybe not. Maybe she's just as rude as he is. Smile at her anyway. Not that grit your teeth kind of smile, I mean a real smile. <laughs> or better yet, offer to let her go in front of you. Hey, at least you won't have bruises on your backside anymore. Or when you come into church during Advent and smile at the beauty of the sanctuary and then you notice that it's not exactly like it's been in the past. And to add salt to your wounded soul, there's someone sitting in your pew. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Say good morning. Admit that sometimes change can be a good thing. Or when your heart is breaking and you sit by the window because you just don't know how you're gonna get through this day, take a deep breath. Read the words of Paul in Romans reminding you that nothing, nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, nothing and feel God's presence near to you in that moment, as near to you as your next breath, giving you comfort, giving you strength. Let's all just take a deep breath. God is with us. Selah. All will be well. Thanks be to God. Say love. Amen.